Hello, my name is Nolan Knudsen, and this is my senior project on how do we break the school to prison pipeline. Now, you might be wondering, what is the school to prison pipeline? I'll get into that in a second. But what it essentially it surrounds is racial injustice and filtering minority kids into the prison system. And why I chose this topic is because racial injust or racial justice itself has always been important to me because my mother is an immigrant. So that's always been a concern. Like, is she getting equal treatment as me? Like, even though I am half Brazilian, I still look white so I can play the card. And I, I still have the concern. That's why it's, that's why I'm here doing this presentation. And my father's father marched in Selma, which inspired me to do a presentation in third grade where I think I gave it as Martin Luther King. Essentially, we had to choose a character that we had to dress up as or just be an impersonate. And we had to say, like, a few things of what our character did, we did, like, and, yeah. So, you know, I would say, like, I helped in the civil rights movement, yada, yada, yada. And on top of this, my father's stepfather was a lawyer, and he helped um, to incorporate and get black men to be able to get jobs in the San Francisco Fire Department. So that was pretty cool. And that also inspired me. But what inspired me to get this topic is my aunt does documentaries on the school to prison pipeline and racial injustice, which is essentially this topic. Now, what is the school to prison pipeline? Well, essentially the definition is the school to prison pipeline, STPP, is the systematic filtering of minority students from the educational system into the criminal justice system. Now, if you read that little paragraph down there, you can see it's not like the Dakota Access, pa Dakota Access Pipeline. It's not like a physical thing that you can find, but it is a system that targets and gets children to either drop out and pushes them out, which I'll get into later too, out of the school system and which where they eventually wind up into the criminal justice system. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Okay, so some basic general facts I want you to hold in your head while we're talking about this is the USA holds 5% of the world population but it holds 25% of the world prison population. That's one fourth of the world prisoners housed in the US. So that's a little shocking. And a black man is has a one in three chance of serving life in his lifetime. And that's, that's shocking as well. Um, so that's essentially six times more likely than a white man. In private prisons, I wanted to talk about a little bit. There is an industry where private prison uh, corporations can join programs. Like, I have an example of one right here. Uh, okay, ALEC. So ALEC is a club where the members are politicians and corporations. And under, under the umbrella of ALEC, corporate members get to propose laws to their political counterparts. And roughly one in four state legislators are a part of this, and they can pass legislation that they want. So that's stricter police force or anything. And then all of it eventually ties back and gets it so they can get more arrests, so they can get more prisoners to these private prisons. And then through that, they get more funding because, and then they have more prisoners, so they need more space to house more prisoners. But then with that money, they use it to pass more legislation so they can get more prisoners. So it feeds itself. And so that's why we have a ton of mass incarceration because it is a literal business. They are making money. And if we look at... If I can just read the 13th Amendment right here, my bad. 
neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for a crime, whereof shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States. Essentially what that says is slavery is illegal unless you're convicted of a crime. Isn't it odd that we incarcerate the, like, the most, the population that is most incarcerated in America are black people, and we have that little tiny little loophole in the 13th Amendment? Well, we still have slavery. Um, so now, they're doing it to children. So what are the causes of the school-to-prison pipeline? Zero tolerance policies. You may or may not have heard of what these are, but essentially... Look, there's a little sticker right here that I've put for us. The use of profanity, verbal threats, or anything. See, and if you do these, they'll send you outside. Or they'll give you a suspension. Or you'll go to the principal's office. Or something. You, they'll, they'll get you out of class. And there is no toleration for it. Or even, they'll have an officer on campus to search you if you're suspicious. They just have to, like, look at you and say, you're suspicious. And usually these kids are minorities. Tell me, just based on my own experience and from the research I've recovered, I've seen and I've looked up that most of these kids stopped by officers or by just school, what would I call them, superintendents, staff, just staff that stop students for troubling behavior or students of color. And... Now, let's get into zero tolerance policies. So, these zero tolerance policies. These target and create pushouts. Pushouts is another word for dropout. I'll talk about that later. You might, because I know you're wondering what that is. If, if not, we'll still talk about it. So, zero tolerance policies are like criminalized, criminalized minor infractions of school rules. Um, so, this is cops on campus. Like, I essentially just broke down. It's them suspending a kid for acting out. Like, sure, on the surface level, if you just heard about that, that would be good. But this is not good for kids who don't have the right support at home. Because all you're doing is sending them home to just stay in that environment. And then they're not inclined to go do the work that you have to... Like, now they're behind on the work that you're doing in class. And they're probably already behind on some other stuff. And you're just, you're pushing them back. You're pushing them out of the system. Because there's only so much they can do. And this could, this ties into poor living conditions. And, um, again, with the mass incarceration, some of these kids, they have a parent in jail. Or one of them is addicted to something. So, they can't get that support at home. So... They're not maybe getting fed enough, and then you want them to come into class and then behave and sit all nicely, and you you don't treat them as like an individual or an intelligent human being. There's no way to reach them like that. Like you have to talk to them and really get to know them and figure out what's wrong. Like how how do we break that? You you can't just use the punishment. You're you're not gonna get out anyway. So what is a push out? It's essentially nicer terminology for a dropout. When I, if I told you that he was a dropout, he or she is a dropout, you would immediately assume, mm, they dropped out of school. Like, they must obviously not care. And that's wrong. Because why would you want to help them? That's not, and that's not always the case. You can't just label it. Like, we love to label things. And it's not always true. And that's just a first impression. It, your implicit bias will make you assume that you know everything about that person, when really you don't. Um, hold on, <laughs> let me catch my thought. So this, a push out. This cover is a documentary my aunt did. Uh, it's called The Push Outs, and it's about what The Push Outs is. My second video ha is a little clip from that, and it shows Dr. Victor Rios, who is the main character of that, it's, it's actual footage of him, and they just talked to him. And he went to Berkeley High, and he was a push-out. And he was filtered through the criminal justice system, but he now has a PhD. Because he really stuck with it. And that's another thing. 
Like, so that it just got me thinking. It's like, why is this happening? So I essentially broke it down. Well, this is just me thinking out loud. It's like, it's flawed policies, implicit bias, you know, zero, tying into the zero tolerance. And then teachers abusing the policies, zero tolerance, and then insufficient living conditions. And then this all comes together and then creates kids who like either struggle with trying or like some of them do try and then they don't have the right resources at school. And this got me thinking like, why is this happening? Does Los Lomas have like, this is the place where I go have enough like support for this. And so I asked kids, this is what I did for part of my thing, along with watching a documentary called 13th. Highly recommend it. You should very much go check that out. So my study was, it was a list of questions. I chose the most important questions, essentially. So, do you feel the school, Los Lomas, does a good job at providing helpful resources to students regarding mental health? 62.2% said no. That's not good. That's 98 responses. Okay, so has mental health ever prevented you or someone you know from performing well in school? 83% said yes. That's not good. Right there. But then I asked them, do you think the wellness center was a good addition to the school? And 72 or 74 points two said yes. Now this conf this confused me. I'm like, okay, you everyone just said that the school does not do a good job, but then most of you got like three fourths of you say that the wellness center was a good job. Why is this? So I asked them, would you go to the wellness center? Still, most of them said no, but still about a little over a fourth said yes they would. Now this still confused me. So I asked them to, you know, give a few reasons. And essentially that first one says, Los Lomas is known for over hospitalization. Pardon me, I can't say that word right now. But, um, so they were over hospitalized. And, um, you know, that's not very much incentive for a kid who's struggling with mental health or struggling with something at home to go in and talk to them, talk to the students and teachers about, hey, look, this is what's going on because, you know, the fear of that. So I could see why that is a problem. And then other people right here on the second quote. Um, so essentially some of the counselors within the wellness center are good and can be trusted with keeping information personal or confidential. But um, I guess they've switched a new desk nurse who sits there. And I've heard reports about that. Like she, she only lets you sit there for like 10 minutes. And this isn't good because this isn't giving the kids enough support that they need. So we have like a good counselor within the wellness center, but the main counselors aren't very trusted among students. So, you know, what's happening? Um, they just don't, students essentially just don't trust the school. Um, but there are, like I've said, a few select people who they do trust. And, uh, like beyond this, just with, like we can see here, just in Los Lomas, we have good support compared to a lot of other places. And just even here, essentially why I took this study is we struggle with having the right support. Now imagine it in an impoverished community where they don't have much, like a lot of these communities or schools have more cops than counselors. Like forget even having like a counselor that you don't even like really want to talk to. This counselor can't even like, there's no counselor there for you. So in conclusion, I think we need to stop, you know, victimizing ourselves like as students, essentially, but by just saying being more proactive and finding a solution. And I think teachers and other students who don't believe in this should say, you know, this is actually happening. You know, we all need to come together and find a common solution. There's no way to avoid this or else it's always just going to keep coming back and coming back in our faces and we're always just going to have to deal with it.
I have a video in my next description.